It's about quarter century or more that modern Islamic banking and finance has been around. And it has moved around, along two parallel streams. One, let us call it official, Pakistan, Iran, Sudan, Malaysia, Indonesia, so many countries are doing it on the government level. The other is in the private sector. For reasons which you will not miss, I will focus, I will focus on the private sector. Why? One should uh, give more importance to states, governments, big names. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. First, uh, very elementary but significant reason is that it is in the private sector that most of the money is. It is individuals, companies, corporations who own the money which you want to attract and uh, move around. So no wonder one should pay more attention to individuals, institutions, corporations, and the private sector. The second, no less important reason is that individuals are the people with conscience, Zamir. You see, I mention this because Islamic finance, Islamic banking uh, has two pillars on which to get a solid, uh, solid uh, standing. One is, of course, efficiency. If these, if these institutions don't make profit for you, don't uh, give you home finance at competitive rates, you won't be becoming their customers. But there is the other important reason that they do the things which satisfy your conscience, which is according to teachings in which you believe, according to values to which you subscribe. So that is no less important a reason. And for this reason, I think we should pay more attention to people with conscience rather than to governments. I do not say they have no values, they have no ideals, uh, they have no conscience, but you know there is a difference between an individual with a conscience and with a realization that he has to face his Lord one day and a big institution, a cabinet and president and advisors, so the conscience gets diluted or diffused. Uh, the third reason on my advice for focusing on private sector is that at the present, our uh, size is very limited. The volume of money which we are handling or which the individual Islamic financial institutions are able to mobilize is not big enough to meet the need of governments. Uh, governments in developing countries, for example, are in need of um, financing their infrastructure, telecommunications, road system, transport. We don't have that much money. We have some modest amount of money which may be better in the service of individual, for example, uh, needing to buy a house, home. People going into medical practice needing some equipment, x-ray machines, MRI machines, other things. Individuals uh, needing a car and so on. So that is another practical reason that we should pay more attention. And it so happens that most of our recently developed products, uh, our Ijara and Salam and Istisna, they are also at the present tailored to meet modest needs, not very big needs which uh, run into hundreds of millions in terms of finance. Lastly, I think, uh, as compared to governments, private sector and individuals, institutions, they are more flexible, they are more innovative, they are quicker to adjust to the changing industrial and financial environment around us. And these are days of monumental change. If you stick to the old ways of doing things, you get sidelined. So this is the last but not the least reason. And I think we, if you go back a little to history, it has been the individual, the private sector, which has been in the vanguard of Islamic financial institution since the middle of the 20th century. As a matter of fact, involvement of the state has been a mixed blessing. Nation states tend to use everything, including religion in general, and Islamic finance in particular as instruments of national policy. 
for promoting their strategic interests and hidden, hidden agendas. In case of authoritarian regimes, Islamic finance has often been used as the tool for consolidation of authority and for ensuring political legitimacy. Priorities dictated by economics have sometimes been forsaken in favor of those dictated by political expediency. This happened in Pakistan in the late 70s when Islamization of the liability side was done first while the asset side of the commercial banks was yet to change. Sudan was no different as sweeping legislations were introduced in early 80s without doing the necessary homework for preparing the ground properly. So it is interesting to note that in the early periods of Islamic history, finance was largely left to the individual. The state exercised hisba, that is regulatory functions to ensure fair dealings, preventing fraud and deception, and monitoring weights and measures and other standards. But it did not take over the positive function of managing the community's savings and investment. One of the lessons of recent history has been that governments tend to over-regulate. These are reasons to believe, there are reasons to believe that a modern Islamic state will be overzealous to regulate. It may even overstep from regulation to full-scale management of the financial sector. One can already discern such a tendency in Sudan, Pakistan, and the Islamic Republic of Iran. But neither the law of Islam nor the maqasid al sharia or the masalih involved require such a policy or even condone it. Such policies can only lead to disastrous results, as the history of the socialist states have shown. Moreover, collective management does not and cannot have the flexibility and innovativeness that Islamic finance requires in a fast-changing world. The moral, especially for the Islamic financial movement in the West in general and in the United States of America in particular, is that we should focus on the private sector, you know, on individuals, at the grassroots. For them especially, not much good will come out of focusing on Muslim countries, coaxing them to adopt Islamic finance, or divert some of their resources toward it by simply issuing a government decree. As you know, Islamic financial movement is before 75, 1975 grew on the basis of dedicated efforts of individual initiatives at the grassroots. The three notable developments in, of interest-free savings and loan societies in Indian subcontinent, which has been documented by Dr. Muhammad Habibullah, that dates back to 40s. The city of Mithram experience experiment in Egypt, pioneered and documented by late Ahmad in Najjar, Rahimahullah, and the Tabung Haji in Malaysia, which won Islamic Development Bank Award for its innovative role. All these date back, all the two, both of them date back to 1960s. Now, uh, all of this came about through individual efforts. Even the Dubai Islamic Bank established in 75, Darul Mal Islami, Al Baraka, all these are based on individual initiatives. These were, of course, parallel to these, there was the Islamic Development Bank established in 1975, and then we have the government initiatives, 1979 Iran, 83, sorry, 1979 Pakistan, 83 Iran, 84 Sudan. Now, a great blessing had this government initiative, official patronage, uh, later on, Pakistan, Iran, and Sudan were followed by Malaysia and Malaysia and Indonesia. It has been a great blessing indeed. I am not the one to belittle it. And uh, I think we should thank Allah that they were there. It is because of the government uh, adoption of Islamic finance that it came on the world scene. It was, it became something visible, something which you cannot ignore, neither the IMF nor the other big players in the world of finance. But unfortunately, most of these official initiatives lack the solid basis in a democratic polity. The beauty of democratic decision making is that it is not hypocritical. 
Islamization of banking in the framework of democratic governance would have had the benefit of wide-scale participation of those involved, bankers, businessmen, accountants, auditors, and the common man, male and female, as depositors or borrowers. The fact that they had a say in decisions to begin with, and in the decision how to proceed, where to compromise, where to stay firm, etc., would have gone a long way in assuring compliance. Decisions taken in this manner and open to revision through dialogue and debate in the light of experience would have been implemented at least as seriously and as sincerely as the other laws of the land concerned. But what we actually had was entirely different, and the results are there for all to see. Those gathered here today can hardly affect the policies of the rulers. Let us hope and pray that they correct but we think that uh, we can gain fully focus on those within our reach, the individuals everywhere, savers, investors, bankers. And it is heartening to note that a number of indigenous Islamic financial institutions have emerged in North America over the last decade or so. Though very small, their strength lies in being community-based. Meanwhile, the entry of conventional players into the field and rapid growth of mutual funds have provided a new source of energy. And I think they will grow, I wish and pray they, that they grow. Now let us lastly consider exactly what needs to be done to bring people around to Islamic banking and finance. In the first instance, we need to reinforce credibility, which has suffered in the recent past both on account of politicians exploiting the idea for promoting their hidden agendas and unscrupulous profit seekers preying on people's gullibility and using religion as a tool. Credibility requires visible operation. Within a framework of rules, everyone can know and understand. Islamic finance has to be transparent, open to inspection by anyone and everyone. It should not be perceived to be operating in a framework of rules largely unavailable in writing understandable only to the select few who can make sense of archaic terminology subject to varying interpretations. It should not be projected as something above the layman's scrutiny, tolerating no dissent, leaving no room for debate, immune to learning by doing, and allowing no flexibility in application. We should never lose sight of the reality that the divine part of modern Islamic finance, though crucial and central, is very small. The rest is man-made, resulting from ishtihad, more than in any other walk of life, mu'amalat, that is worldly transactions in general and finance in particular, require continuous interaction between the scholars and practitioners for arriving at laws that really ensure the goals of Sharia in a particular time and place. It was so in the heyday of Islamic jurisprudence. It requires a similar environment today. But that environment does not exist at the present. We have to work for it. And I hope and pray that meetings like this one we are having today are designed to create such a movement. Thank you all.